So next up, we have a pretty cool talk. Uh, if you give a container capability, uh, and this is a, a tale of container exploitation by uh, Vikas Kumar and Rob Glu, please give them a warm welcome. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Glu. Oh, did this not go on? All right, we're good. There we go. All right, uh, so I'm Rob Glue. Uh, this is Vikas Kumar. Uh, this is our talk, If You Give a Container a Capability. Uh, we are basically going to be going over what makes a container a container, uh, what security boundaries are put in place to keep things separated, and where that tends to break down in actual container deployments. Um, just a quick blurb about us. Uh, we are both security consultants at NCC Group, and we do hacker things, but let's just get right into it. Uh, so this is just sort of a high level overview of what we will be going over for this talk. Uh, we're going to go, basically we're going to start with a process that is just running uh, completely uncontained. And we're going to just start with pseudo process one, pseudo process two, and then add one layer at a time and sort of explain what protections get put in place at each, uh, at each uh, layer. Uh, we're going to give a high level summary of how these protections are actually implemented in real container solutions and where it sort of deviates from the ideal. Uh, then we're going to sort of outline how you check for these things if you're just a consultant or someone who just gets dropped in a container and you want to sort of figure out how you might be able to get out or mess with the host and other contained processes. Uh, and finally, uh, we are going to release a tool to sort of help check with all the things that we go over. Uh, so, quick intro to what a container is, in case you're not already aware. Uh, containers are lightweight alternatives to virtual machines. Uh, and so the idea is that you have a container running w on the shared kernel with the, uh, shared kernel with the host and other containers on the machine uh, so that you can sort of run different flavors of Linux on the same host. Uh, and this is done over using like a full virtual machine. Uh, because for a full VM, you need to run an entire another kernel on top of your host kernel, which obviously has a good chunk of overhead. Uh, now, sometimes uh, cont containers are used as a security boundary. So for if, uh, like for example, you're a cloud provider and you want to have your customers run arbitrary code, you might say, let's just run it in a container because uh, it'll be a lot faster and it'll be much better. Um, and finally, these containers will allow your processes to run as root or what appears as root to them, uh, but still be heavily restricted in what they can do on the host. Uh, so another quick summary of what these protections that we're going to be going over are. Uh, we have basically pivot root to make these processes think they have their own dedicated file system. Uh, we have capabilities to limit what syscalls someone can make, uh, setcomp to limit that even further. And uh, then we'll add namespaces, which sort of restrict what resources a process can uh, actually access. And then there are other random protections that uh, are not as significant, but still uh, you know, don't hurt. Uh, so for our uh, sort of uh, theoretical situation here, we are sort of looking at this from the perspective of a cloud provider who wants to run uh, you know, customer code. And you know, these customers need to have all the access possible. They need to have root access. They need to touch all the system file systems. Uh, they need to be the only process running on the host. Or, well, from their perspective, uh, they need to perform some syscalls that may or may not require root privileges. Um, and our theoretical cloud provider is going to say, we're going to use containers to sort of keep these things separate. Uh, obviously, some of the customers might be malicious, and so we want to make sure uh, that there are enough protections to keep one customer from going in and stealing all the data belonging to uh, other customers. So this is just sort of a visual representation of what we're working with. Uh, we have two of our tenants, and they are, you know, both have access to system resources. Uh, they have access to the kernel, CPU, memory, network, file system, etc. Uh, and so. What we're going to start out with is our uh, naive approach, where we just run pseudo tenant one, pseudo tenant two. Uh, obviously, this has tons of problems. The the two tenants have access to each other's data. Uh, they can kill each other's processes. They can p trace each other. 
Uh, they can access the full host file system. They can just generally wreak havoc. Uh, and you know, so this is l the exact opposite of what you want to do here because all the problems we worry about are a problem here. So the first step we're going to take is to make these processes think they have their own file system. Uh, so we use pivot root for this, which is sort of uh, very similar to a ch root, but uh, it basically provides uh, more separation. And so the intent of this is to create our custom root file directory uh, that uh, will put our container, our contained process in. Uh, so in the example on the right here, we have, uh, you know, an example Etsy SSH config setup. Uh, so on our host, we create our slash new root, and then we put a fake Etsy SSH SSH config into it. Then we call pivot root, and then according to the contained process, it just sees that etc ssh ssh config, uh, you know, at root. Um, so what this perfection or what this uh, protection does is it lets us uh, convince our contained processes that they have their own dedicated file system. So when we create this new file system, we set up all the system files. We provide everything that the process needs in order to do uh, in order for it to look like it's like a full Linux system. Uh, so when it comes to real containers, they just do this. Uh, they use pivot root and create a new mount namespace, and uh, they use pivot root over ch root because it doesn't have as many uh, security guarantees. Uh, and this combo basically just disassociates the process from the host's file system. Uh, so, uh, and then while it sets everything up, the container solution will copy relevant files into this uh, this new new file system. Uh, so if you are a hacker just dropped into a container, uh, you want to look around for files that were explicitly included in the container solution that should not have been. And so this is things like access tokens, SSH keys. Uh, you also want to take a look to see if there are any devices mounted from the host. So if they mount uh, like a whole file system that contains some sensitive files, you might be able to modify bad things on the host. Uh, and another thing that you want to check for is if you're checking out a Docker solution, uh, you want to look to see if the Docker socket is available anywhere. Uh, and so the Docker socket is a Unix domain socket that's used to manage the Docker daemon on the host. Uh, and occasionally, uh, someone who's creating a container and running their own software in it wants to have their software communicate with the Docker daemon. And uh, obviously, the most straightforward way is to just include this socket within your container. Um, but uh, being that this is the domain socket that's meant to be used to manage Docker itself, uh, there's a lot of very dangerous things you can do with it, and it's essentially just free root on the host. Uh, and so if a developer provides the Docker, uh, the Docker socket in your container, uh, you can just use it to get a free escape. Uh, so while this is a good start and our different processes can actually run on the same machine and not stomp on each other's files, uh, it really doesn't stop uh, malicious processes in any way. Uh, our contained process can still make uh, any syscall it wants, and so there are numerous ways for it to get uh, direct access back on, like the direct access to the host file system, uh, which is obviously bad because if they get access to the host file system, they can modify files and escape again. Uh, and so while things run, it's, there's still a lot of things that our contained process can do. Uh, and so the next protection that we're going to go over sort of uh, limits what syscalls a contained process can make and can be used to sort of uh, mitigate the effects, I guess. So in Linux, the root user's permissions have been split off into finer grained capabilities. This includes like the ability to bind services to privileged ports or perform mounts, for example. Um, this allows you to run processes that need some level of root access, but not full root access. For example, you could run TCP dump as non-root by giving it the capabilities net raw and net admin, which allow it to sniff packets, etc. So if, you need a, if there's a process that supposedly needs root, you should find out what specific capabilities it needs and drops everything else, drop everything else. It lets you have a root user or root process that can't actually do everything root can do. So how does this work in practice? Uh, real container solutions drop many capabilities on, like the, during the initialization of the container. And the way this works is they drop them in a way where they cannot be regained through normal means. Um, 
Specifically, there's this thing called the capability bounding set, which we'll get to like more detail later. But basically what it does is it says these are the max amount of capabilities that this process could ever have. And let's say you run a set UID root binary, you won't be able to get more capabilities than what are in your bounding set, even though it's a set UID root binary. Um, sometimes in container solutions, like dangerous capabilities are granted, such as DAC read search, sysadmin, and others listed. These are essentially free escapes in that they let you call dangerous syscalls that let you affect the host and gain code execution or file access. And there's other dangerous capabilities like net raw and net admin. While they don't directly give you a container escape, they let you perform network attacks. And lastly, um, there's this notion of privileged containers, such as in Docker, which essentially gives a container all the capabilities, and these are trivial to escape, and you shouldn't do this. So let's walk through an example of how we can use one of these capabilities to escape a container. Let's say we're given the DAC read search capability. DAC read search is a capability that lets you run the syscall open by handle at, which lets you access files or directories by inode number instead of path. Because we're in a pivot root, we can't actually see the host's um, root directory. But we know its inode number is 0, 2. So we can use the open by handle at syscall to get a file descriptor to the, um, the root directory on the host. And the open by handle at syscall basically takes three arguments. First is a file descriptor to something on the target file system. The, and the reason you need this is if you're referencing something by inode number, you don't necessarily know which file system it's referring to, because if you have multiple file systems, many things could have inode number 0, 2. So you have some file descriptor to something you know is from that file system. And then you have the second argument is basically a struct that's a wrapper around the inode number. And the third argument are like flags, which is how you deal with weird cases, such as you're, if you're trying to get a handle to something that's a symbolic link or something weird. Um, so once you call this open by handle at, you have a file descriptor to the root um, directory of the host, and you can just chroot into it, and now you have full file system access. So let's say you're dropped in a mystery container. How do you find what capabilities you have? You can check what capabilities you have with the status file in like proc1 status or proc self status. This will have a numerical representation of a number of different capability sets. And the two you really care about are cap F, which is the effective capabilities, and cap B and D, which is the bounding set of capabilities. Um, the effective capabilities are the capabilities your process has right now. It's what you can currently do. And the bounding set is like the maximum capabilities the process could have through like normal privilege escalation means, such as like running a set UID binary or a set cap binary. So we've successfully limited what the root user can do by dropping a number of dangerous capabilities. But let's say uh, one of our tenants needs something that sysadmin can do. They need to be able to mount something in specific. But we don't want to give them all of sysadmin, because sysadmin is a capability that gates a large number of syscalls. It grants too much power. So we can use seccomp to limit the syscalls even further. This allows you to block syscalls on a per syscall basis, and you can also block syscalls based on the arguments passed to that syscall. This both can let you like, grant dangerous capabilities and limit what they can do, but also act as a second line of defense if you somehow escalate privileges and gain additional capabilities. So how does this work? Um, at a low level, this uses the PRCTL syscall, which has um, like two relevant modes. One is the strict mode, which creates a seccomp sandbox where the thread can only call read, write, and exit. Um, this, this is like a very good sandbox, but this is, what's not, this is not what's normally used. What's normally used is seccomp mode filter, which allows you to create a Berkeley packet filter to restrict syscalls and arguments to the syscalls. So what's a, Ber <clears throat> what's a Berkeley packet filter? A Berkeley packet filter is basically a VM inside the Linux kernel that runs this weird bytecode, and it has like a number of uses, and that could basically be its own talk. But in short, it's one of the things it enables is seccomp BPF. You can create bytecode that filters syscalls based on the syscall or the arguments of the syscall. Um, all of this is wrapped by libseccomp, which allows you to create seccomp policies in like a more human-readable format. And like human configurable. 
So how does this work in practice? Um, a lot of container solutions will have a like, default set comp um, profile that may or may not be actually useful. Um, for example, Docker's default set comp policy um, automatically grants exceptions if a capability is granted to the a process. For example, if, you're, if you gain the DAC read search capability, the set comp um, profile will no longer block the open by handle at syscall, which kind of defeats the purpose of being defense in depth. The logic behind it is the Docker developers were like, oh, if they're granted this syscall, we want it to just work by default. We don't want like, to have users struggle or developers struggle with creating custom set comp profiles. But sometimes um, when you're trying to do things, set comp will block what you're trying to do. So developers will write a bad custom profile or just turn off set comp. So how do you check your set comp profile if you dropped a black box into a container? This is difficult. One thing you can do is just enumerate all your syscalls and just like do them and see what gets blocked. This will tell you if uh, like a syscall is explicitly blocked or not, but you won't be able to necessarily find rules that block syscalls based on the arguments because brute forcing all the potential arguments that are allowed or not is difficult. So ideally if you're pen testing a container solution, you just ask your client really nicely to give you the set comp profile. Uh, another way you can like, add defense in depth and limit what the root user can do is mandatory access controls. This includes SE Linux or AppArmor. These are both Linux security modules and they restrict resource access by applying security context, applications or processes, programs. And they can limit like, very narrowly what files on like, even the container file system a given process can access. In addition, like AppArmor could block certain or all mounts it could deny network access, and it can even like redundantly restrict capabilities. So even if a capability is provided to a container, an app armor um, profile could be like the backup and block the capability. So in practice, a lot of the times SE Linux or app armor are not enabled. It depends on kernel version, like your container runtime version, and there's a lot of inconsistencies which will cause SE Linux or App Armor to just not be supported. You can check your App Armor profile from within your container by looking at this um, adder current file within the proc file system. You can also check your SE Linux profile dynamically with LS capital Z, or outside the container, you could look at the SE Linux rule set with the shown path. So we've greatly limited what the root user can do. Um, we've limited their capabilities, what syscalls they can perform, but there's still a few issues here. Um, one is that they have unrestricted access to consume CPU and memory resources, potentially performing denial of service of other processes on the same host. Also because like proc and other system files are mounted or put into our pivot root fake file system, it's possible that we could still influence or see or kill um, other like tenant processes. Um, in addition, there's not really a restriction on network access, both to the like host network interface and to other container services. So the next protection we're going to be putting in place will limit what resources our contained process can access. Uh, so this will keep our contained process from interacting with uh, the host processes or processes in other containers. Uh, and this is done through uh, namespaces, which is a feature exposed by the Linux kernel that allow you to sort of put uh, processes in various groups that will only let them access resources that exist in that group. Uh, so for example, a process namespace will only allow your, if your process is put in a process namespace, you can only see other processes that exist within the same namespace. And so this is what allows our contained process to think it's the only thing running on the system uh, when it's actually not. Uh, and so there's other namespaces t that allow this sort of segmentation. So for example, network namespaces will only allow your process to access network interfaces that are in its own uh, namespace. And so this is what allows you to keep a contained process from interacting with the host machine's uh, network interface. Uh, so you just like create a custom interface for your containers and you only allow processes in that network namespace to access that one interface. And then you can have uh, pretty good control over the traffic that goes through it. 
Uh, there's also mount namespaces, which only allow you to see devices that are mounted in that namespace. And this is what's combined with our pivot route to provide a separation from the host's file system. There are also user namespaces, which are a bit more complex that we'll go over on the next slide here. But it's worth noting that for all of the capabilities enumerated here, if you are granted enough capabilities, or sorry, for each of the namespaces explained here, uh, if you are granted the right capabilities, you can just get around everything. Uh, so, like, process namespaces, network namespaces, mount namespaces don't mean anything if you grant the contained process too much privilege. Uh, user namespaces, however, are more complicated than the other namespaces that we went over. So not only do they just only allow users to interact with other users in their namespace, uh, it also drops a large number of capabilities and heavily restricts what sort of syscalls you can make and how you can make them. So the goal of this is to, uh, like, once you add a process to a user namespace, you can only exercise capabilities on resources that are explicitly in one of your resource namespaces. And so, for example, if you are in a network namespace, you are only allowed to exercise your net raw capability on your network to namespaces. Um, it also drops any capabilities which, ref which uh, are used with resources that are not associated with any namespace. So, for example, sysraw IO, which lets you directly mess with your, uh, the memory of the machine, uh, is just blocked altogether because there's no namespace which manages the resources that that uh, capability grants access to. Uh, and then finally, user namespaces do what the name suggests in that uh, map, it uh, lets processes running in the user namespace only see, uh, you know, makes, it lets the process think that it's running it as UID zero and is the only user on the machine, while uh, outside of that user namespace, the host machine is aware that it's running as like a higher privileged user, or uh, sorry, a higher user ID pr user, uh, and it will you know, perform appropriate security checks on that. Uh, so when it comes to real containers, uh, the best approach would be to just turn on all the namespaces. However, when it comes to actual, like how things are actually done, uh, the container solution may or may not turn on all the namespaces. So, for example, Docker by default doesn't have user namespaces enabled. And th as, you know, we spent all that time talking about all the protections that user namespaces provide, and it, you know, is able to provide protections if you grant too many capabilities. Uh, it doesn't let you touch anything outside of your, uh, your namespaces. Uh, Docker just doesn't have it enabled by default, and it can be kind of a pain to get set up if you are a developer. So, as a result, developers may or may not actually do this. Uh, and so, when you are dropped in a container, you want to sort of poke around and see what namespaces you have. Uh, so another alternative for using like a user namespace would be a developer might just run the process in the container as an unprivileged user, but if the user gets UID zero somehow, so either through running a set UID binary or something along those lines, uh, they would be running as the actual root user and have all the capabilities that were granted uh, to that contained process. But yeah, if they do escalate to UID zero, they'd still be restricted by capabilities, uh, set comp, and mandatory access controls. Uh, so now is a good time to sort of look at the what you can access through the network if you're a contained process. So Docker by default has all of the containers on a shared namespace, so you, the containers can all talk to each other, and if they have sufficient capabilities, they can perform network attacks on each other. Uh, so for example, uh, Docker grants net raw by default, uh, and so if you're on a default container configuration, you can just sort of perform these, some network attacks on the other containers that are running on the host. Um, if there's no namespacing, you can just attack the host directly if you have those capabilities. Um, but you also should uh, consider what your container can actually access on the local network. So if you have other internal resources that are accessible from the server running the containers, uh, you can still dial out and hit all of those. So when it comes to checking for all of these namespaces, it's generally there's, you can quickly heuristically check and guess whether you're in a namespace or not. So for process namespacing, you can just look in the proc directory. And if you see a whole bunch of processes that look like they're running on the host, you know process namespacing is not enabled. And you can, you know, collect data about those processes that are running on the host. So you can get like what command line arguments were passed to them and that sort of thing. Uh, the scientific way to check this is to run LSTAT on uh, proc1 NSPID, 
And if you get a device number greater than four, it means it's namespaced. Uh, for using namespaces, you can open up a file which lists all the mappings that are used for your user namespace. Uh, so in the example here, it maps user ID zero to user ID zero, which means uh, there's no namespacing enabled. If it is enabled, you would see, for example, that the user ID zero is mapped to some high number UID. And that would be the UID if the process is viewed from outside of the user namespace. Uh, for network namespacing, you can similarly do a heuristic where you just do ifconfig or look at uh, sysclassnet and just see if any of the interfaces look like it is probably on the host. Uh, you can also lstat proc one nsnet, and if the device number is greater than four, it, you're in a network namespace. Mount namespaces, you can heuristically look at proc self mounts to see what devices are mounted uh, from the perspective of your uh, process, and then you can also do the lstat trick on that as well. So now that we have all these namespaces, we have our pivot root, we drop capabilities, we implemented a SE Linux profile or app armor profile, and it's almost there. And we more or less have our contained process. And our contained process can't really hit much outside of its container, and it's fairly limited in how it can attack the host. Uh, so the next thing we're gonna go over is sort of how you limit uh, denial of service attacks, because we don't want one process to just chew up all of the resources uh, and sort of choke out the other processes. Uh, so this is done through C groups. Uh, it's a system file system, and so you can just go in and you know, look at how much resources you're allocated. Uh, one thing that is sort of counterintuitive is C groups also limits what character and block devices you can access. And so you, if you, you can set up a, like a C groups uh, device whitelist so that uh, any process in the C groups uh, in the C group would only be able to access like dev u random and dev null or something like that. Uh, and it would, it's a second line of defense if somehow they get a handle to uh, dev SDA. Uh, you can just, yeah. So when it comes to checking this out, if you're dropped into a container, uh, you can just read files that will tell you whether you have uh, your CPU shares limited. You can also read a file that'll tell you your maximum memory that you're allowed to use, and if it's some absurd number like 64 gigabytes, you can probably safely assume that you're not limited at all and you can just choke out anything else that's running on the machine. Uh, when it comes to the device whitelist, you can uh, go through the devices.list file and it will list like a, it's a big list of devices that are a device type, a major number, and a minor number. And this is, uh, you can basically use a reference table to figure out what type of devices it points to. Uh, so for example, dev u random has a specific, uh, you know, it's a character device and a specific major number and a specific minor number. And so if you see that in the whitelist file, you know that it's, you're allowed to use dev u random. Uh, dev null has like a different major, minor number, et cetera. And so when you're dropped on a container, you want to look at this list file and see first if everything is allowed, and then if it's not, you can just sort of go through item by item and see what devices you're explicitly allowed to access. And so this is pretty much there. Um, we have a very controlled process that thinks it's running as root, but it can't actually do anything. It can't access a whole lot outside of its own namespaces. Uh, they can't directly interact with each other's processes, like our tenants are, you know, separated. Uh, we've limited what network attacks can be performed on the host, uh, but there is still like a handful of attacks that you should consider when you set up your container. So one thing to keep in mind is the core basis of containers is that all the containers on a host um, share the same kernel as the host. So if you have a kernel exploit, you can like free escape the container, um, mess with the host, mess with other containers, et cetera. This is greatly limited. Like the attack surface of the kernel is limited by mandatory access controls, set comp, like limiting what syscalls you can call, capabilities, again, limiting what syscalls you can call. C groups also acts as a kind of defense in depth mechanism. For example, if there's a potentially vulnerable device driver with some character device with some like vulnerable ioctal handler, C groups might limit you from even talking to that device driver and exploiting it. But it's important to keep in mind that older kernels may not fully or properly implement all these security measures we talk about. So it's important to keep your kernel up to date.
So let's say you find a privilege escalation in the kernel version that's running. You have some way to go from a low privilege user to root. How do you turn that into a container breakout? Like a normal-ish payload in a like a kernel exploit will be to prepare kernel creds and then commit them. And what this does is this like replaces the cred struct associated with your user process with one that gives you UID zero, um, gives you all the capabilities. It disables Linux um, security modules, which like turns off SE Linux and App Armor. It also disables user namespaces, but it doesn't actually give you full file system access immediately. For that, you need to change the FS struct associated with your process. Um, however, we have the previous DAC read search exploit, and because the normal exploit will give us the DAC read search capability, um, we can now just use that exploit, get the handle to the um, host file system's root directory, chroot into it, and now we have um, full file system access of, for the host. Another thing you should keep in mind in a container solution is check if you're on Kubernetes. Kubernetes runs like multiple different API servers to manage everything. There's like etcd, which has an API and it stores like the cluster configuration information. There's the kubelet API, which is used to like manage hosts and pods, and the Kubernetes API, which is what a Kubernetes administrator will talk to to like actually configure their Kubernetes cluster and environment. Um, each pod will have a service token which can be used to authenticate to the Kubernetes API with a service account. And sometimes the, this token gives high privileges in the Kubernetes API. And you can use this for essentially a free um, <coughs> container escape. You can just tell the Kubernetes API, hey, spin up a privileged pod which will have all the capabilities with the whole file system, host file system mounted read-write. And that's just an easy escape. Another thing is that the Kubelet API can have unauthenticated remote code execution. This essentially gives you like code execution within a pod, and you can kind of chain this with the previous thing, gain code execution within another pod, steal their service token, and try to escalate privileges that way. In addition, the etcd API can sometimes be un unauthenticated, and you can use that to directly modify Kubernetes state and configuration. And Kind of related to this, you should also check like what cloud environment you're in. Um, if you're in AWS, can you hit the AWS metadata service? Um, if the host that you're on has an like IAM instance role like assigned to it, there'll be IAM credentials present in the AWS metadata service, and you could steal those if that that like network access to the AWS metadata service is not limited. Also, sometimes like um, things like Chef or Puppet will put in its scripts or like in its certificates or secrets in the user data portion of, for example, AWS metadata service. And a container on a host could just steal that user data and steal those relevant secrets. So we wrote a tool called Conmachi, which is uh, basically a Go tool uh, statically compiles into a binary, you just drop it in a container, and it collects a bunch of information for you. It checks capabilities, it flags dangerous ones, it looks for mounted volumes, it looks at your C group policy, it looks at all the namespace configuration, it sniffs the network to find out the like, IP addresses for other containers in the host so you could like attack those. And it's still in development, we're continually adding features like Kubernetes scanning, et cetera, to it. Uh, we're open to feature suggestions. It's to be released very soon, TM. So uh, keep an eye out on the NCC group GitHub for it. We're just wrapping a few things up and going through like our internal tool release process. So now for the demo. So here we're um, launching a Singularity container. Singularity is like another container runtime like Docker. And We'll run our tool here, and it's part, like enumerated a bunch of information, like the Linux kernel version, which you can use to try to find exploits. It detected that the runtime is singularity. Uh, enumerated the different capability sets. It found that, oh, there might be some potential hardware attacks on the host. It could be vulnerable to Meltdown Inspector. It's noted, noted that seccomp is disabled in this container, and that there's not an app armor profile. Um, in addition, it's noticed that user namespacing is not enabled. It's listed all these different things that are mounted from the host that could be potentially dangerous that we'd have to investigate. 
Um, it also like notes specifically what capabilities in the bounding set that could be dangerous if you get UID zero, and then it notes that the container is not using process namespaces. Uh, So uh, just to sort of wrap things up, from the perspective of a developer, uh, it's worth noting that containers are much better than nothing. Uh, so if your choice is run your stuff in a container versus just run it straight on the machine, uh, you will want to use a container because it's security measures that you wouldn't normally have. Uh, then you want to go in and make sure that your solution enables all the namespaces. If you're using Docker, uh, make sure you go in and explicitly enable user namespaces because that's sort of the big one that provides the most for you. Uh, don't grant random capabilities to your container. Uh, don't mount random things in the container. Uh, copy stuff instead. Don't run a privileged container. Don't give your Kubernetes pods service access. Uh, container, and I'll also consider what uh, your container can access on your network. So if you're running on a cloud provider, make sure, or at least uh, consider that your Docker container may be able to hit the metadata service and think about what sort of information exists in there. Uh, if you're running it in like a data center or something, consider what other servers the container might be able to hit. Um, <clears throat> if you're using Docker, uh, drop the net raw capability, which is enabled by default. And if you're using something else, uh, consider what capabilities it grants to your process. And if just drop anything that's dangerous, ideally drop everything uh, if you don't need any sort of root permissions. Yeah, basically, just be aware of all the security controls and make sure they're all flipped on. Uh, but if you're a pen tester, uh, this is sort of a short cheat sheet of what you should be checking for. Uh, look at what your UID is. Are you UID zero? Uh, what are your capabilities? Are any of them dangerous? Uh, what namespaces are enabled? Uh, and be very aware of if user namespacing is enabled because that shuts down a lot of your attack surface, even if you are explicitly granted capabilities. Um, check for anything that's hosted, uh, mounted from the host and see if any of them could potentially be system files or other files that might be read by processes outside of your container. Uh, look for the, do that includes like looking for the Docker socket. Uh, look at your C group policy. Uh, see if you can just, you know, chew up resources if you feel like it. Uh, see if the, what devices you can access. Uh, look at your uh, kernel version and if you have something super out of date, uh, see if there's just some easy pwn where you just like drop it in, run it, and just get root. Uh, because if you're running on an old kernel, there might be some old exploit for you to get root and just escape from there. Although you might have to modify your payload to a little bit in order to turn it into a container escape rather than just a privilege es escalation. Uh, look at what you can hit on the network, scan things, sniff traffic, that sort of thing. And then, again, just poke at your metadata services. Um, I think that's it. Uh, if there's any questions, all right. Thank you very much.